Hi, I'm Nick Warner, part of the men's health team at Mayo Clinic. And today I'm going to be talking about transurethral bipolar nucleation of the prostate with tissue morselation. First, we're going to start with a little bit of an anatomy lesson. So the prostate is a walnut-sized gland that sits at the base of the bladder. The urethra runs right through the middle of the prostate, and the prostate functions in eating and reproduction, but also has a role in urination in the sense that the prostate, when we're walking around, is closed at rest, and only when we urinate, it opens and allows the urine to pass through. So those are the roles of the prostate. Now, as the prostate gets enlarged, it can close off the urethra. So even if the prostate otherwise opens, that excess tissue can allow the urine to pass through more difficultly. We don't understand exactly why the prostate increases in size as we get older, but we definitely know that it does, and it's a very common problem for older men. Next, we're gonna talk about a nucleation. The nucleation refers to the surgical removal of a mass without cutting into it or dissecting it. And I think the best analogy is an orange. When we core out an orange and leave the peel around, that essentially is enucleating the orange. In this example, the prostate is very much like an orange because there's what's called the adenoma, which is like the fruit of the orange, and then the capsule, which is the peel of the orange. And what we do surgically is we take advantage of a natural junction that exists between the fruit and the peel, just like peeling an orange. And we're able to remove the inner part of the prostate and leave the outer part alone. Morselation is a division into small removal pieces, such as a tumor, or in this case, our adenoma. And what it is, essentially, we use a small device to mulch up the tissue, and this allows us to remove it through the urethra without making a big open incision. So this is just kind of a graphic of what we do. Imagine here's the prostate. You've got the shell or the peel of the prostate. Inner part is the adenoma, and that's like the fruit of the orange. And using a scope, we can peel those structures apart or separate the junction, just like peeling an orange. Once the tissue is completely free, we push it into the bladder and introduce a device here called the morselator that mulches it up and takes care of all the pieces. So what are the advantages of transurethral nucleation? Well, first of all, we can treat any size prostate there's a very low chance of regrowth of tissue. So really I like to tell my patients that this hopefully is a once in a lifetime operation. And really the data around a nucleation would tell us that there's a 20%, sorry, a 20 year retreatment rate of less than 1%. It's very successful in patients who have urinary retention. Uh, so anybody who's on self catheterization or has to have an inguine catheter because their bladder isn't working well enough for them to void on their own, even if patients have been told they have a non-functioning bladder, it's still a good option. And also if somebody's been told they have a huge bladder, two to three liter bladders have been treated effectively with this operation. We also know that the enucleation offers superior flow rates compared to some of the other operations that are out there, especially some of the more minimally invasive operations. Another advantage of the transurethral enucleation is that there's no abdominal incisions. And what this means is you don't have to worry about any hernias down the road or any bowel obstruction down the road. Overall, it's a pretty short operative, sorry, short post-operative catheterization time. Usually most patients spend the night in the hospital and they leave the next day without a catheter. Um, I just wanna spend a minute on some special surgical circumstances. Even in men who have very, very small prostates but are in urinary retention or having significant uh, bladder dysfunction, this operation can often be successful. Oftentimes patients come in and they tell us that an outside doctor told them they'd never be able to urinate on their own without a catheter. And in that case, we can generally get people urinating okay. Now, to do the enucleation, you can use any source of energy. Lasers are probably the most popular. Colmium laser particularly, or what's called the HOLEP, has become really popular of late. Uh, Tholmium laser is another option, or also green light can be done to do the same operation. I prefer actually what's called the bipolar energy. And this is the same energy essentially as a lightning bolt, also called plasma energy. Um, and why I prefer this is it offers several key advantages over laser. One, I think you have better perspective. Uh, number two, I think it's easier to teach this operation. And three, uh, the bipolar energy sources are very prominent in most hospitals, whereas some of these specialized lasers are more difficult to come by. Um, but what's important is that the data comparing bipolar versus HOLEP particularly has shown that their outcomes are the same and similar side effects. So really no advantage of one over the other. It's sort of a surgeon preference. So bipolar nucleation, my preoperative workup generally 
pains a cystoscopy to rule out a urethral stricture. But if somebody's doing self catheterization or they have a inborn catheter, then I don't need to do a cystoscopy. And then the other thing, probably the most important thing, is how big is the prostate? Prostate size matters because that really helps us understand what particular complications are you're at risk for, um, but also helps us understand how long the operation should take. The prostate size can be estimated from any number of imaging studies. Ultrasound, MRI, or a CT scan are generally sufficient, and if those are done within the last two years, that usually covers us. I'd say the ideal candidate has a prostate that is over 80 grams in size, and there's no upper limit, or if a patient has a history of retention. So even if the prostate is very small, I still think this is an ideal operation. A less ideal patient is less than 80 grams. And why that is, I think the complications are actually higher with smaller prostates. Um, also, patients who have primarily storage symptoms, where they have to avoid often, they can't urinate very much, they may have a small bladder. I think doing this operation often leads to different types of urinary incontinence. Also, anybody who wants to preserve ejaculation, uh, this is not a good operation because most of our patients will lose ejaculation. So let's talk a little bit about side effects next. First is infection. About 1% of the procedures we do will result in an infection. Uh, bleeding risk is very low with this operation. I'll say that minimal bleeding is expected, but significant bleeding is exceptionally rare. The transfusion rate is about one in a thousand cases. Um, erectile dysfunction can also occur, um, but I would say that this is very rare. In the majority of our patients, I would say that uh, erectile function is maintained at the same degree. However, retrograde ejaculation is very common. Close to 100% of men are not going to be able to have ejaculation after the operation, and they need to spend a minute on that. What's meant by ejaculation is the emission of fluid out the end of the penis during an orgasm. From the surgery, men are still able to get erections. They're still able to have the orgasm, but instead of going out the end of the penis when they have an orgasm, the semen goes backwards in the bladder and then it's urinated out. It doesn't hurt you, but it does make it so you cannot naturally have children. Um, and so that's important to know the difference there. Uh, the other problem is incontinence. And incontinence is defined as leakage of urine when you don't want to, essentially. Most commonly after this operation, we develop what's called stress incontinence. And why that happens, if you remember earlier, the prostate closed at rest while we're walking around, right below the prostate's the sphincter muscle. After the operation, the prostate's wide open, and so we depend on the sphincter muscle alone for the first time in your life. And if you have a very big prostate, it hasn't had your sphincter muscle hasn't had to do work for a long time on its own, and so it takes time for that muscle to, to recover. If you think of an astronaut coming back from space, it just takes time for those muscles to regain their strength. Um, the degree of incontinence is generally bad early on in about 10% of men. Um, but if we go all the way out to a year, that rate drops to about 0.5%. So it's not common long-term, but it is fairly pre prevalent um, in the short term, particularly if the prostate is over 150 grams, if your age is over 80, or if you're overweight. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is stricture formation. Stricture is a scar tissue that forms in the urethra, and that can happen anywhere from the junction of the bladder and the prostate all the way out to the end of the penis. The two most common locations the end of the penis, which happens about one to 2% of the time, and the junction of the bladder and the prostate, which is pretty unusual in big prostates, but tends to be more common in smaller prostates. So that's just things we'll have to watch for. If you do develop a stricture, generally you'll have more trouble urinating and sometimes be unable to urinate. It does require another operation to fix. Um, the last one, which is essentially more of a that theory, in theory, could happen is what's called a bladder injury, particularly during the morselation part. This device uses a very small blade that sucks the tissue in and then mulches it up into pieces. And there's a chance that the bladder gets sucked in, um, in which case I'd have to make an open incision to repair it. Uh, we've done close to 800 cases and I've never had to do this, but it, in theory could occur. When we look at the recovery, surgery takes about one to three hours based on the prostate size. Usually one night in the hospital, catheter stays in. There's going to be a constant flow of irrigation going through the bladder to prevent uh, clots from forming. Usually what we'll do in the morning is turn that irrigation off. If the urine stays clear, we take out the catheter. We make sure that you can urinate, and then you go home without the catheter. About 5% of patients have to spend the night longer or keep the catheter in longer. Then we ask you to do light activity, which means no sexual activity for two weeks, no heavy lifting for two weeks, no sit-ups, push-ups, or anything like that, anything that strains the belly. 
really only light walking. Uh, we also want to make sure that you uh, avoid constipation. So we definitely make sure you go home with some stool softeners. Um, you can start home Kegel exercises around two weeks after the operation. There's a lot of good YouTube videos on those. We also have some Mayo resources we can share with you if necessary. For home medications, we will have you stop all of your prostate medications. This includes Flomax, Finasteride, Sopalmetto, or anything you're taking just for the prostate. You don't need it after the operation. We will send you home with a prescription for pyridium. Pyridium is a good medication if you're having any pain or burning when you urinate. Otherwise, don't take it. It turns the urine orange and it uh, doesn't need to be on board if you're not having any pain when you urinate. Um, otherwise, we just send you home with some over-the-counter Tylenol as well as some over-the-counter stool softeners. And I encourage you to take those stool softeners for up to a month until your stool is normal. So really there's three things after the operation that we worry about. First is a fever, uh, greater than 101 Fahrenheit. Uh, in this case, it's best to head to the closest emergency room. If you're really unwell, then they'll admit you, start you on some IV antibiotics. Otherwise they'll check your urine culture and get you started on some oral antibiotics. It's important to get that culture though, because the urine is always gonna look infected right after the operation, just because there'll be some blood and some white blood cells in the urine after the surgery. Uh, second thing is if you're unable to urinate, usually a lot of clot or a piece of tissue can clog up that urethra. It's not often that this happens once you leave the hospital, but if it does, again, just get to the closest ER, and come back to the clinic and they get a catheter put back in. Uh, the third thing is if you pee and the urine looks real thick and chunky like salsa or ketchup, what that means is there's too much bleeding. And before long, if you don't get a catheter put back in is that you're gonna have a urinary retention. So it's important to uh, get back. So three things, fevers, can't pee and salsa. Uh, what's normal? Essentially everything else, small pieces of tissue, small clots, red urine, leakage of urine, bleeding after bowel movements, bleeding after intercourse, more frequent urination, more sudden urination, burning with urination. All those are pretty normal. Uh, again, the three big concerns are fevers, can't pee, and salsa colored urine. Um, those are all the comments I have. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us.